ξέρω τι συμβαίνει μεταξύ των πολιτικών και με το καθόλου πλέον τη φυσική ενέργεια στην Ελλάδα και μα στη συζήτηση που θα γίνει. Ε, θα γυρίσω στα αγγλικά γιατί έχουμε και κάποιε συνομιλητέ μα οι οποίε θα, θα συνδεθεί από το Λονδίνο ε, για να κάνουμε τη κουβέντα μα στα, στα αγγλικά. So, we have Mr. Walker also online with us. Yes, perfect. He's there. So again, in English, uh, it is my pleasure to be uh, hosting the Minister of Energy and Environment uh, here for this uh, discussion that uh, we will be having about uh, balancing between the energy crisis and green energy transition. We have some uh, great speakers with us here, which uh, I will invite them to, to the panel. If uh, we can have Mr. Elefteriadis, I see he's, uh, he's here. Mr. Walker is already online, uh, connected with us. And uh, Mr. Sifneos, Kosti, if you can <coughs> join us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, uh, Minister, we're talking about an energy crisis which has been uh, an unprecedented energy crisis. It's the worst crisis uh, in energy in the energy markets, globally speaking, that we have probably ever seen. And uh, we have uh, seen uh, governments all around the world, but uh, primarily the European uh, uh, governments and uh, the respective ministers of energy to uh, try to tackle this issue. We are almost one year after the, uh, the beginning of, of this uh, crisis. And uh, so many things have, have happened uh, post the invasion of uh, Russia to Ukraine. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, efforts to try to put a cap on uh, natural gas prices, on the TTF price. Uh, we have uh, seen the Greek proposal plus, uh, I call it a Greek proposal that I know that has been initiated by you and uh, you know a lot of other colleagues of yours that are supporting the fact that uh, a cap should be lower than the one that has been proposed by the EU. As of today, it's uh, impossible for someone to miss that and uh, say that uh, we have the effect of uh, cap in uh, oil prices, in crude oil prices from the European Union at the $60 per barrel level, which probably it seems that uh, is not uh, working at least on the first day as uh, it would have been expected. And I would like your comments to tell us a little bit about uh, what are the latest developments from uh, your, your colleagues in, in, in Brussels, at the Brussels level, and what should we be expecting in the days to come? Well, indeed, we are facing a, a tremendous energy crisis, and uh, the European governments and the European energy ministers have two major tasks. Challenging, very challenging tax. The first is to guarantee security of supply, mm -hmm. and the second is to guarantee affordable prices for the households and for the businesses. Both are quite, uh, uh, as I said, ch challenging uh, things to, 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 to do. What uh, have we done regarding the affordability of the prices? Uh, here in Greece, we have uh, designed and we have implemented a, a windfall tax uh, mm. uh, mechanism. Uh, so uh, we have placed uh, a regulated cap for the compensation uh, for the electricity generators according to uh, each technology. So we have uh, put a cap on hydro, a cap on renewables, a cap on lignite uh, power plants. And the difference between the price cap and the wholesale uh, price, we are captioning it, we are recovering uh, it and we are returning it to uh, the bills of the households. Until now, we have recovered more than 2.5 billion euro from, the, uh, from this uh, uh, windfall tax that we have applied. We have also, until the end of the year, we have um, uh, allocated almost 8 billion euro for, in order to subsidize the bills of the households, especially the most vulnerable, and for the small, medium enterprises, 70% of that amount of the 8 mm. billion euro are coming from the windfall tax mechanism, from the revenues of the CO2 auctions, and uh, from the state budget. Uh, now, uh, what we have done in order to secure the, uh, sec uh, the adequacy of, of supply we have uh, established, we have placed at a record time uh, a, a floating storage unit in Revithusa, which is our re gasification uh, plant there, in order to be able to uh, upgrade uh, and um, 
uh, expand the utilization of the gasification uh, plant that we have there. Uh, there we can accommodate two ships at the same time, and we can uh, provide ship-to-ship -ship services, which is very important. Uh, so we have increased a lot uh, the LNG imports this year, <coughs> uh, and therefore we have been able to, ex to increase the exports of LNG. So this year we have exported 2.5 billion uh, cubic meters versus 0 0.7, just 0 0.7 BCM uh, last year, showing our solidarity to Bulgaria and to mm. the countries uh, even northern uh, to Bulgaria. Now, in the medium and long run, we are preparing a second FSRU uh, in Alexandropolis. Kopelouzos uh, group uh, was the project promoter, the initiator of that very critical infrastructure uh, with a gasification capacity of 5.5 BCM that will give us opportunity to uh, diversify completely from the Russian gas, from Russian gas imports, if necessary, uh, from 2024 onwards. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have a third one, a third FSRU, already near to the final investment decision in the Origa. And of course, last October, we inaugurated the uh, IGB gas pipeline, the new uh, uh, pipeline that uh, interconnects uh, Greece with Bulgaria with a capacity of 3 BCM, upgraded to 5 BCM uh, if necessary. Uh, uh, but this is regarding the uh, security of supply of gas. Yeah. But the security of supply in general uh, terms has to do not only with the, the diversification of the sources of gas supply, but also of, of the types of the energy that we use. So, for example, Greece uh, ranks eighth in the world when it comes to the contribution of renewables into our electricity mix. Uh, this year we will deploy almost 2,000 megawatts of renewables. Mm. Uh, by 2030 we want 80% uh, of the electricity consumption to come from renewables. That means that we will significantly reduce gas imports that today we use in order to generate electricity. So in the last four years, in the last three and a half years, in Greece we have deployed more than four gigawatts of renewables. Uh, if we had done this four years ago, five years ago, today we would need uh, significantly uh, fewer uh, gas yes. uh, to produce uh, electricity. So that is why we are preparing uh, uh, the upgrading of the, electrici of the electricity interconnections with the neighboring countries. We are doubling the electricity interconnection uh, with Bulgaria by the end of the first quarter of 2023. We are doubling the, the, the interconnection with Italy and with North Macedonia, and we are tripling the electricity, the electrical interconnection with uh, Albania by the end of uh, 2030. And let me also uh, outline two major projects. One is the electricity interconnection, the first electricity interconnection between North Africa and South Europe, between Egypt and Greece a three gigawatt electricity interconnection, a submarine, submarine one, and another electricity interconnection between Greece, Austria, and Germany. Direct cable mm. that will give opportunity to Greece all this green energy, which is, is going to produce, which is currently pr uh, produced, but it, it will be produced as well in, in the future, together with the green energy that we are going to import from Egypt to export it directly to the center of Europe, and thus, we are transforming Greece into a major hub, not only for uh, gas and for LNG imports, but also for, in, for uh, green energy. And therefore, we are transforming Greece uh, to a central, uh, central pillar uh, for security of supply for the, north, uh, for the no southeast uh, Europe. So, in your opinion, uh, the developments that we have seen with the spark of this energy crisis, are they accelerating the energy transition, or do you, you, do you think that they are posing some uh, obstacles to the energy transition compared to what we have been discussing a year ago? Your, this is, your, your point is right, that uh, the energy crisis has accelerated green transition. Because green transition, what uh, essentially is doing, mm. is to uh, secure affordable prices, predictable prices, significantly lower CO2 emissions, so we eliminate also the causes 
of the climate, uh, of the climate crisis, and of course, security of supply. Why? Because sun and wind are sources, energy sources that we uh, have here in Greece. Uh, in abundance. Uh, 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 <laughs> let's say in, in, in rich quantities. Yes, exactly. Uh, I, I will move to Andrew uh, Walker, the Vice uh, President of uh, Senior Marketing. He's the uh, Head of uh, Strategy and Communications of the, of the group. Uh, Senior is the pioneer, the leading uh, company from uh, the U.S. that is exporting uh, liquefied natural gas, the first to, to do so, uh, with a significant importance uh, that has played in the discussions that we have seen over the past year through the midst of the energy crisis. The fact that uh, we have been talking about diversifying Russian gas, Russian pipe gas, with LNG coming from a more uh, reliable and stable source like the American LNG. But I would like the perspective of, uh, of Andrew of uh, you know how the, uh, uh, to which extent, extent has this been achieved? Uh, what are the prospects for US LNG in the coming years? And uh, you know, in relation, if you can share with us a little bit more about uh, your perspective with Europe and the European situation where we are now. Uh, which uh, shows, I mean, all signs show that, you know, L LNG is back in business, if I may say, compared to what has been happening a couple of years ago. But uh, w w what would be your view on, uh, on all of these points? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Costas. Hopefully you can hear me okay and see me. Yeah, great. Firstly, uh, my apologies to the rest of the panel that um, the conversation has to be in English. Um, my apologies for that. My, my Greek... Uh, is non-existent. Um, thank you for that, that introduction, uh, Costas. In terms of LNG, I would posit the uh, thesis that actually LNG didn't go away, but it has, of course, become much more important. It's become much more important because of the pivotal point that um, Europe is in terms of its energy supply, in terms of energy security, um, particularly in the near term. We've seen, uh, as you said, Europe uh, looking to move away from Russian gas, looking to move away very rapidly. And the options at its disposal to kind of cover that are um, fairly limited. They are limited to demand impacts, energy efficiency, speeding up the energy transition, as, the, as His Excellency the Minister said. And of course, pulling in LNG, um, into the European market to replace the Russian gas. To give you some idea of, of really the role that um, LNG and US LNG in particular has played, we are, Europe as a whole is going to uh, see uh, a reduction in Russian gas supply of about 80 BCM this year, uh, year on year. In terms of increased LNG supply, it's going to see an increase of 50 BCM year on year. Um, importing LNG at, uh, at record levels um, across Europe. That 50 BCM is replacing much of the Russian gas, 50 plays 80, and of that 50 BCM, that increment, almost 70% of that um, increment from last year has been provided by the US. So the US playing a critical role in terms of um, flexibility of supply, in terms of growth in supply, in helping Europe really keep the lights on uh, and more importantly, probably keep the heat on this winter. Um, and I think as we look forward, there are some important uh, points also for Greece uh, as an entry point into Southern Europe. Uh, Greece, an important uh, entry point for the Balkans and up into Central, uh, Central and uh, Southern Europe. And really, um, Greece becoming a, a key energy provider for its neighbours in a way that perhaps we didn't foresee uh, a number of years ago. So that's really a, an overview of, of where we are, uh, as, as my introductory uh, comments cost us. So I'll hand back to you, uh, and I look forward to picking up some of those points in more detail in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I will uh, pass it on now to Mr. Sifneos, uh, Vice President of Gas Trade and Managing Director of, of, uh, of the company, uh, one of the persons that were there from the beginning of, of, of the concept of, of the project. Uh, as the Minister said, we are 
the, the company is planning for a second FSRU, so uh, we are already thinking of the expansion of, uh, of the existing infrastructure. If you can share with us uh, your point of view of uh, you know, how important this piece of infrastructure is, but uh, also quite important, how do you see the future of uh, natural gas slash LNG, either form, piped gas or liquefied, uh, for Greece in the coming years? Thank you, Kostas. Um, good evening to uh, the Minister, good evening to you, Andrew, good evening to everybody here. Um, I think we are, we are living through it in, in unprecedented times, and um, well, I, I'm not, you know, there's, there's a question mark whether the, uh, the conversation has changed, and is that a temporary uh, change um, from a transition to a zero carbon uh, footprint to energy survival, because that's what we're talking about, and whether the two are mutually exclusive. I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, from what we heard today in previous times, transition to a decarbonized economy is, is part of the solution, of course, is part of the solution for, uh, um, to, for the energy crisis. Uh, but it, it cannot be a one-step process. I think the geopolitical dimension of energy uh, is in the center of the design of the policies. And the, the energy security and diversification of supply uh, pops up as the predominant priority uh, as European strategy uh, abruptly realized that dependence from Russian gas and Russian hydrocarbons has proven to be particularly detrimental to the robustness of the European uh, acquis. And I think um, uh, LNG uh, um, is, is really now an enabler uh, to green transition as it offers the uh, necessary stability to allow European policymakers to take the uh, required steps towards the 2050 targets. Now, um, just to focus a little bit on our neighborhood, um, a neighborhood being Central Eastern uh, and Southeastern Europe. Uh, this is a, an area where traditionally depend, dependent on, on Russian gas. And we've seen on 2021 numbers, about 23 to 24 BCM, excluding Ukraine, um, about 60% of the demand of that region was supplied by uh, Russian gas. And, um, Mind you also that this is one of the areas that the few areas in Europe which uh, have a growth potential as well. Uh, we've seen some initiatives uh, which I think they temporarily stopped, like de lignitization uh, of power production. So I think we're looking at a material uh, gap in this region where LNG has a significant role to play. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the thing that we realize is that the, the, the only um, uh, infrastructure that is here to uh, diversify uh, the supply of gas is, is really uh, very limited. So it's TAP and it's the, the two LNG terminals that exist in the region, which is Revithus and Kirk. And Kirk is a, is a relatively small terminal. So um, I think one other thing that we need to understand is that um, in this region, uh, from Poland all the way down to the south, uh, the LNG import capacity is only 10% of the region's gas demand. Whereas the same time in uh, Western Europe, the same number is 43%. So you can imagine the gap in infrastructure that we have uh, in this region. Um, so we need new infrastructure, and I think the Alexandropolis terminal uh, now uh, and the Thrace terminal uh, in a few years are there to cover a significant part of, of this gap. Um, and they both con can contribute and support the development of the vertical corridor, 
which I think um, is a, an initiative uh, of which we uh, uh, witnessed the signing of the MOU uh, in Athens a few days ago, and uh, whose core anticipated values uh, sits in ensuring and exploiting the complementarity uh, and seamless dialogue between existing and new gas infrastructure in the region. Only then the citizens and the businesses of this region will fully capture the benefits of smooth and reliable transmission of gas, increased flexibility and liquidity, and eventually affordability uh, of energy in uh, southeastern Europe. Um, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the Alexandropolis terminal, which is now under construction. We will start operation 1st of January 24. It will become the second LNG terminal uh, in Greece and the third in southeastern uh, Europe. Uh, it will connect, as the minister said, uh, through IGB Greece to the markets of southeastern and central Europe. Um, to come to your point, uh, Costas, as well, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the second FSIU that Gas Trade is developing in the same area, Thrace LNG, uh, which is now licensed and will be ready in early 2025. This is a project that uh, potentially uh, effectively can support the supply of Ukraine uh, from Greece by use of the, uh, the vertical corridor in its south to north direction. And, and finally, just to close um, my remarks uh, here, I would like to point out what is, in my opinion, the most important contribution of the Alexandropolis terminal to the region and to Europe. And I think I have a picture for that. And, and this is a project that opened and continues to open channels and widen the channels for regional cooperation. Uh, it demonstrates how energy can become the tool for solidarity. And finally, I think it positions Greece to the center of the geopolitical developments as a reliable leader of this sensitive uh, area. Excellent. Thank you, Kostis. I see. <coughs> so, Mr. Payet, uh, in I think this is from the shows so four heads of states. Uh, and the head of, of uh, um, May, the uh, European May. Council uh, in the inauguration event we had in Alexandropolis in May, minister was there, yeah. uh, lots of uh, ministers and, and members of governments. And, and the, this project, together with IGB and the other projects, they, they demonstrate how countries can move forward together and, and what really the role of Greece can be in this region. And we can see the support of the, the U.S. Uh, uh, element here in, from the government, the embassy, that uh, has been very supportive. And as Andrew has said, 70% uh, uh, about of uh, you know the increase of uh, the incremental uh, growth of uh, LNG supply into Europe is coming from the U.S. So we see uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, if you wish, uh, level of solidarity also from uh, the other side of, uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, I would like to also uh, uh, ask to join in our conversation uh, Konstantinos Eleftheriadis. He is the uh, partner uh, with uh, Deloitte uh, as a, an energy industry leader. Konstantine, uh, we have seen that the, energy, the green energy transition has been unfolding a lot of challenges, also from a regulatory point of view, from policy perspective. Um, we are talking about uh, infrastructure uh, developments, as the Minister uh, has been saying, and Mr. Sifneos uh, has been mentioning. Permitting of renewable energy, the new environment for the green energy transition to, to unfold itself and uh, find bankable financing, uh, financeable uh, projects. And uh, these are initiated with new mechanisms. We have the Hellenic Energy Exchange in place. We have. Uh, bilateral corporate PPAs that are also initiating some of these investments. How do you see uh, all this environment and uh, whether Greece is in a good uh, path on, in terms of accelerating this uh, energy transition? And how do you see that from your perspective, from your clients, from the industry that you are serving? Thank you, Kostas. First of all, I would like to say a good evening from my side as well. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, 
I would say that uh, we are living in uh, some difficult times, but uh, as many people have said, uh, when we have a crisis, then we have also many opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the good thing or the bad thing is to be on the, on the right side of the coin. And uh, I think that Greece, uh, nowadays, we are at the right side of the coin, uh, and we are not only leaving the consequences of the crisis, but, but we are also taking advantage of the, and the benefits uh, that uh, we can see also from this acceleration. And we can really see, because um, uh, being in the consulting business for more than 20 years, what we have seen, we, we can see waves, waves of investments. And uh, one wave were, was uh, uh, a decade ago when we had the privatizations, and now we can see a huge wave of investments uh, towards the, the, the green energy transition and also uh, other kind of investments coming in Greece. Uh, we are discussing with investors every day, and uh, it's local investors, it's global investors, and there is a great appetite to invest in, uh, in Greek projects, especially in renewable energy, but not only renewable energy. Uh, we, we, we can see a great appetite to participate in market tests for, for FSRUs, uh, to book capacities there. Uh, they see Greece becoming an energy hub, and this is important because it's, uh, I think it's a game changer. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Sinos also mentioned some numbers, but uh, last, in a couple of years ago, we were seeing only the perspective of the Greek market. So we were discussing only about Greek uh, quantities of LNG. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are discussing about a new project, we are discussing about the wider region and uh, a huge amount of volumes that we were not considering before. And this has a great uh, significance on uh, project valuations and everything. Now, uh, coming to the changes, uh, what I would say is that uh, the crisis has acted as an accelerator for everything. It's, it's LNG, it's a gas pipeline, it's renewables, it's hydrogen, it's storage. It's accelerating everything. Uh, we have a big market. We have a, a market that is booming. Uh, so everything and all technologies is taking advantage. Corporate PPA is a significant uh, element on that. Mm -hmm. I think it can be, a, 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 as I mentioned earlier, a game changer. Uh, and it is not only good for the energy market, but it is also good for the competitiveness of the energy industry uh, and the Greek in industry, industrial players uh, in total. Because when you are, in a, uh, when you are playing at a global scale, uh, you have to compare also with uh, entities from Spain, from the UK, from uh, Germany. Uh, so we cannot afford having uh, industrial corporate entities here in Greece. Uh, to pay this amount of uh, electricity prices, they have to pay lower prices, and this can be done through corporate PPAs and bilateral agreements. Uh, so, uh, corporate PPAs is a, uh, is a significant thing. We have some, not obstacles, but some milestones that we have to, to overcome. Mm -hmm. uh, having the cap is one of them because it, it creates some issues uh, on the PPAs. Uh, we have uh, also, uh, we need to educate the market. Uh, banks will play a significant role on, uh, on PPAs. The bankability of the project is uh, very, very significant. And we are also facing some issues from a uh, financial part. Uh, we will need a clearing house at the end. And uh, abroad, banks are playing this role. So I think that uh, banks will play a more significant role in PPAs uh, compared to what we have in mind at the, at the moment. Uh, so we have to overcome some obstacles, uh, some milestones, and then I think that we are going to, to see also some uh, a part of the market being different for uh, corporates, and PPAs are going to play a significant role in that. Thank you, Constantine. <coughs> Minister, if I may come back to you, to what we have heard actually from our previous speakers. Uh, what do you see as uh, the next things that the government uh, should undertake following what we have seen over the past year? Uh, the initiatives that you have already taken, but uh, listening to maybe some obstacles or some limitations that may exist, uh, are there any specific plans for enhancing, let's say, the support to the Greek industry because of this high energy cost? And uh, I know that uh, the, the government has announced a number of uh, different, uh, uh, you know, support uh, plans on this. 
Uh, and um, w w what is your view of uh, how this uh, will end? I mean, in terms of uh, European uh, solidarity in, in general and uh, European uh, cohesion, because we have seen that uh, many times Europe is delaying some of the decisions, and uh, we have already seen a kind of a two camps uh, in, uh, in, the, in your discussions in the energy ministerial. <coughs> so, do you see that we may have an alignment and we may tackle the problem uh, unified? You are right when you say that Europe has delayed in terms of ta taking the necessary decisive uh, actions to tackle the severe consequences of the energy crisis. So we see now the results of that delay mm. because we see many European industries reducing the production or even closing uh, some departments of their production. We, show, we see, we are seeing the European uh, metallurgy suffering, aluminium companies, uh, glass. Industries. All the energy intensive uh, So industries. all energy intensive industries really are suffering currently. And that means that the society will suffer at the end of the day because when the industry reducing, is reducing mm -hmm. production, then we are going to have uh, unemployment rate uh, increasing, and that means that the society will have a problem. So, but still there is time to take the necessary actions. What uh, the Greek Prime Minister, Mr. Kyriakos uh, Mitsotakis, said right from the beginning, since last March, is that we should uh, take some really decisive measures in order to address the speculation that currently uh, is been uh, from from what we are suffering currently in the energy exchanges. So we have a single player, which is Russia, manipulating currently the energy exchanges. So we uh, currently Europe is buying four, five, sometimes even seven times more ex more expensive gas than any other continent in the world. And there is no reason; it is unreasonable for Europe to buy the most expensive gas in the world when the fundamentals are not yeah. here, are not there. So, um, what uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis said uh, in a letter that uh, was sent to Ms. Vaderlein last month is that we should uh, apply a price cap, a dynamic cap, a dynamic corridor, doesn't matter how someone is calling it, in order to bring down gas prices and therefore reduce electricity prices which are linked to the gas prices. Uh, I think that now we are 15 member states, 15 member states quite aligned together. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, Greece uh, who has shown uh, uh, great leadership in this, uh, in this uh, movement, I would say, Greece, Belgium, Italy and Poland, together with Spain, together with France and uh, 10 other uh, member states. Now we're trying to persuade the other member states who, uh, which uh, they have some concerns, maybe reasonable, but I think that we have addressed those concerns for potential gas shortages if we apply uh, an horizontal price cap. So I think that finally we will find uh, a consensus and uh, we will um, guarantee lower prices of gas for the winter, for the next winter, yeah. but also for the winter after this winter, because maybe 23, 24, winter 23, 24 is maybe uh, more difficult than this one, more challenging than the current one. Uh, and I say this because now we have 96% uh, of our gas storage are full of gas. Mm. Uh, we have also managed to reduce gas demand. In Greece, we have reduced gas demand by 32% over the last three uh, months, and uh, year to day we have managed year to date to reduce it mm. by 18% on, mm. on average. We have reduced electricity consumption by 12% on average over the last uh, three months. So now we have, uh, and we have also a mild weather until now. That's, that helps. So, so now is the time to test. Mm. such a mechanism as an horizontal price cap, dynamic cap, 
because we have the reserves full mm. and we have uh, less uh, consumption. Uh, it's going to be much more difficult next summer to try to apply such a mechanism because now we have the flexibility and maybe we can test the, the, the mechanism and we can adapt it if, if necessary to the, to the changes. But for the question that you made, what are we going to do after the crisis? Because the crisis may be 23, 24, some time, at some point it will finish, it will end. So green transition again, again is going to give the, a permanent solution for uh, uh, guaranteeing uh, lower affordable prices and competitive electricity prices to the two industries. Here in Greece, we are uh, promoting green PPAs. We have uh, submitted uh, a scheme called Green Pool to Digicomp in order to take the approval, and therefore we will be able to maintain uh, affordable prices for mm. industries, and we're going to increase their competitiveness in such a way. Uh, it is important to have uh, a mechanism, even if we are late in this first crisis, because many analysts are also uh, expecting that uh, you know this high level of prices, maybe not as high as today, they will probably be maintained over the years to come, uh, not only for one year, but maybe in the next three, four, five years, uh, given the plans that many countries may have initiated in terms of either shutdown of uh, you know, other more uh, dirty generations that they may have, or the fact that the, the um, renewable energy projects are not actually being penetrating in the market as fast as many would, uh, would expect. We have in our country, I know the statistics show that we are doing very well. I mean, uh, two gigawatt compared to 400 megawatt maybe as a historical, uh, let's say, average that we had before. Is, 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 a, is a big uh, leap, a uh, step ahead uh, it is, in this it is worthy, direction. Uh, it is worth it to, to mention that uh, an EY's report published two weeks ago uh, states that Greece is uh, among the first two, is the second country in the world when it comes to the attractiveness of renewable investments. Mm. So renewables storage systems, we have to deploy um, between seven and eight gigawatts by 2030. Uh, interconnections, renewables, we have to, mm. to deploy 28 gigawatts of renewables in order to, uh, to, to achieve that uh, very high penetration of 80% of the electricity mix to come from the, from the renewables. But I say again that today to generate, to produce electricity from the sun is three to five times cheaper than producing electricity from gas or from oil, or even from, from coal, if you add the, the carbon tax. And here in Greece, we import 100% gas and oil. Yeah. Until, of course, the time that we found something in our uh, reserves, uh, after the explorations that we are currently uh, doing, implementing. But, so renewables is a, is, a, is a solution also for competitive European industry and for competitive uh, societies and viable, viable societies. Because after all, this is what we have to, to, to maintain, to eliminate uh, the causes of the climate uh, crisis. Andrew, uh, I was thinking of our conversations like seven, eight years ago, before you have even started you know, exporting LNG from, uh, from the United States. And we were discussing about the macro analysis of the LNG, globally speaking. And it, it used to be that the, the, the LNG business was more of a, you know, uh, uh, it, it was supply-driven business. I mean, there was not a lot of demand out there, and we were thinking that you know demand will increase in the coming years, and we need to catch up with the supply, and that's why you know even the senior plans had the meaning uh, at the time, and other European uh, and sorry uh, U.S. Uh, uh, LNG projects uh, had a meaning. But what we have seen is a so uh, fast acceleration now of demand, globally speaking that I am sure that we are, we are seeing a demand-driven uh, LNG market and not that much a supply-driven market, which means that supply is trying to catch up. So what do you see in, in the market uh, for the years to come, and uh, where, where do you place uh, the U.S. in this uh, environment? Because uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be enough U.S. LNG in the coming years to, to supply Europe and the needs of the, of the world. We're not alone. You know, we see China, India, you know, Southeast Asia increasing their demand a lot, and uh, you know we will be fighting for for, for LNG as we probably have done in the past uh, few months. 
Okay, um, that, that's a, a, a good assessment, I guess, Costas, um, of our discussion seven or eight years ago. In the interim, the, the world, I think, has become cyclical, is, is how I would um, kind of describe it for LNG. So we, we, we're going through periods where it's demand-led, uh, we're going through other periods where it's kind of supply-led. And we're clearly, we have clearly uh, been through a period of high growth where it was supply-led, and we're now into a period um, where demand is clearly uh, leading supply. We expected this even before the current um, issues driven by Ukraine and the uh, European move to replace Russian gas. I think the good news, well, there's as ever, there's bad news and good news. I think the bad news was that as we looked forward, we saw three big supply centers supplying the world's LNG needs as we look forward based on their gas reserves, the US, Qatar uh, in the Middle East and uh, Northern Russia. So the bad news is that those are really two, uh, for most people, those are now two supply sources, the US and Qatar. However, I think the good news is that there is an ability for both of those to scale quite quickly and quite significantly. We're seeing big expansion plans uh, in process in Qatar. The US, we have many uh, individual projects, expansions uh, moving forward based on a huge gas resource based on an abundant cost-effective gas resource. Chenier, my company, has already taken FID this year on a 10, 10 million tonne expansion. We are building that as we speak. That will be in place, first LNG, by the end of 2025. The push from the US, the push from Qatar, uh, will help bring the market back into uh, balance in terms of LNG and LNG supply. You're right, there are other demand centers. What Asia does is important. What China does is, is the biggest LNG market now is important. But we are confident that um, supply, and in particular the US uh, supply, can respond. Our view is that US LNG exports, and the US is already the uh, largest exporter by capacity, we could see that pretty much um, double in the coming decade or just over the next decade. So significant expansion. Do you see a new wave of uh, long-term contracts now compared to <clears throat> what we have seen a couple of years back where more short-term agreements were, were in place because probably the, the low price levels were helping that? We, we're already seeing it, I, I have to say. Um, this year is going to be the record year for long-term US SPAs uh, closed. Uh, so in the uh, decade or so that Chenier has been selling volumes, um, this is the this is the, going to be the record year uh, for Chenier and its competitors in terms of closing out long-term contracts. So clearly, customers see the benefits of long-term contracts in terms of in terms of energy security in the current market. That has become even more important in terms of price stability. So it, I have no doubt that we will see um, those contracts turned into um, infrastructure capacity as, as we go forward. Mm -hmm. And those folks who commit to the long-term contracts will own the volumes, will own the option as to where those volumes go. Some of them will take them to their home markets for energy security. Some folks will use them as portfolios to supply the markets of greatest need at spot, spot prices. Our we have advocated uh, for many years now, both when markets are very low, and don't forget it's really only two years since we saw record low spot prices as well, mm. that the best way to plan your long-term business is a mix of um, supply. Take your security through a diversity of geographic supply, through a diversity of term contracts and spot mix of long-term contracts and spot give you the opportunity to um, be in, in charge of some of the volume and, and, and some of the, provide energy security for your home market. And we're certainly seeing people move back towards long-term uh, volumes in, in their mix, whereas may, they may have been focusing towards spot volumes um, in the last few years. Thank you, Andrew. Kosti, uh, I will move to, to you asking, the question uh, that probably will 
enhance and emphasize the regional role that the FSRU is playing in Alexandropolis. But given that the Greek market is about about 70 percent, like 67 percent of the consumption goes to electricity generation, what is your the long-term prospect of natural gas here in Greece if we move? to a greener, let's say, electricity mix in terms of uh, renewables penetrating the market. Do you see uh, Greece playing a, a key role in terms of its uh, gas as a gas transit country, a gas import country as well, and uh, helping supporting our neighborhoods on, in the north, as you illustrated before, with a vertical corridor? I will uh, <coughs> shift the uh, question a little bit, Kostas. Um, Firstly, there was an initiative uh, um, which was announced um, when this government came into power, which was about the uh, shutdown of lignite production. Um, and that would have triggered anyway a, a, a significant demand increase in, for gas in Greece. Uh, that initiative, uh, I'm sure it has been um, temporarily posed, uh, and it will come back to play uh, when uh, the energy security, um, it, it's, it's not th that, um, th that predominant priority. <clears throat> but Greece has, you know, even if Greece had doubled their consumption, I don't think that's, that's the key question here, the key question, and I think it links with the, um, with the long-term supply contracts, is um, we, we need to start looking beyond our borders. Uh, and, and, and that is strategically the way to look at the market. Uh, and that is why the infrastructure which is built, it's important to be complementary. It's important to create liquidity um, for this part of the world. Uh, uh, creating a flexible and liquid uh, gas hub will, um, uh, will enable uh, eventually suppliers and consumers to balance their market uh, supply and demand, uh, and then eventually prices will come into terms. But, you know, prices are driven by the balance between supply and demand. Um, it, you know, new infrastructure is needed and complementarity is needed. And as the crisis has demonstrated that security of supply is now the predominant, um, uh, the predominant priority, this is what is driving uh, more long-term contracts rather than spot. Mm. Um, so I, I think this is the way the market goes. But on the other hand, this is the way um, that we will address uh, the crisis and will allow uh, the policymakers to continue on the green, green transition. Thank you, Kostis. Uh, Kostadine, the green transition, uh, as we have seen, uh, is uh, uh, giving a lot of space in to investments that are both in uh, natural gas. It has been always the, the fuel of transition, as has been called, but uh, we see that uh, even with ups and downs and different difficult situations, it still is uh, in the spotlight. Uh, maybe different pieces of infrastructure now, like FSRUs uh, or, or import or export terminals. And uh, green investments, renewable energy projects, solar, wind, as we have seen, but they need in order for them to, to operate efficiently and to be able to penetrate the, the mix efficiently. They need storage, they need uh, new technologies. Uh, we have seen uh, a lot of effort uh, recently also, or announcements at least at the European level for hydrogen and uh, other, uh, as we call, alternative sources of energy that uh, with storage efficiencies there that they can actually support this renewable energy penetration. How do you see this evolving in the Greek market? Definitely, we have many investments on the table, and uh, we have to, to see which of them are going to play, because uh, many of them, they are competitive, mm -hmm. and uh, we cannot end up having 10 FSRUs, uh, or even if we take into consideration a wider market. Uh, however, uh, the number that we can have might be higher compared to the one that we had in mind two or three years ago. 
uh, alternative routes uh, uh, will result to a bigger uh, number ending to investments in Greece. Uh, we can see uh, green investments, uh, we see green investments taking a significant uh, part of the whole investments that are taking place in Greece. Uh, so I think that uh, given that, uh, as uh, everybody said in this panel, we are discussing about a wider market, not only a Greek market, uh, I think that there is a room for many investments in order to be realized in the, in the Greek economy. Uh, most of them are going to take place in the renewable energy uh, sector, but uh, many of them and some heavy investments are going to take place also in the LNG and the uh, gas uh, infrastructure. Uh, but we have also taken into consideration the internal uh, mechanisms of the market. We have to take also into consideration balancing, because we are discussing about uh, uh, infrastructure, but gas infrastructure can play also a significant role in balancing, because we have storage, but uh, storage is not mm. on the table as we speak. So all of them, they are going to have a portion in the market, and the good thing is that market is evolving and it's increasing numbers, so many of them, they can be successful at the end of the day. Thank you, Constantina. Uh, just a very short announcement I have to make. I forgot to discuss that at the beginning. The next panel with, uh, Ambassador, with uh, uh, Minister Payat is not going to be taking place. I used to call him the Ambassador, even that he has been here for, for so long. Uh, so the discussion with Mr. Bakatselos is not going to take place uh, because, uh, unfortunately, he has been uh, sick and we have not been able to, to have him with us. Uh, but uh, I would like to, to close our uh, discussion by giving the opportunity, I know that Andrew uh, would be uh, pleased as well, having the opportunity to have the minister in our panel to maybe ask a question so we can uh, switch a little bit the, uh, the, the, the mode of, of, of the panel discussion here. So I'm not going to be the only one asking the questions, just to uh, short, uh, uh, shorten uh, a little bit the, the, the discussion on one hand, but uh, give the opportunity to you to uh, ask something that you would like uh, to ask the minister. You have been with him last week. I know you've been in Athens for uh, the gas, uh, big uh, gas summit, but uh, if, if you have anything for us to, to be able to provide an answer to you, I don't know if you have a question. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, thank you for that opportunity, Costas. Um, even though it's uh, quite a surprise, yes, you're, you're correct. I was in Athens last week at the uh, LNG uh, summit. You were in London, I believe, so we did a, an exchange. I did have the pleasure of seeing uh, His Excellency speak at the summit, and I agreed with much all, everything that he said in terms of the vision for Greece. Um, so I guess, I guess the one question I would ask is... Um, what, what, Your Excellency, what, what is it that you feel you need to do in order to deliver the vision, the vision that the US has of um, Greece as an energy corridor, um, the US as an, L as an LNG supplier into the region? Uh, what is it that you feel are the most important things that, that you can deliver to that equation to, to move that forward? I think that, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, okay. now yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, what we have uh, already managed to do shows what is the potential of Greece. So let me say that uh, almost 50% of our consumption, of our imports are coming from LNG. 65%, mm. 62% of that 50% comes from the US. So what we have done already over the last four to five years uh, shows exactly what uh, you are asking for. And uh, it would be a mistake if I wouldn't mention the contribution of uh, Minister now uh, Payat yeah. and of the support of the United States uh, of America to be able to elaborate that strategy because a few years ago, Greece was not in any energy map of Europe, was not present in any energy map. We didn't have not even one uh, gas uh, pipeline passing through Greece. We didn't have, we had 
air gasification capacity, which uh, for sure we had uh, 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 managed to have the provision to, to build it 20 years ago, trying to diversify from our single supplier at that uh, moment, at that time, who was Russia, of course, and, and Gazprom. But still, Greece's role uh, has not, uh, had not been developed. Uh, over the last five years, we managed to uh, make sure that TAP uh, passes from Greece and up to Italy, and also FSRU, an FSRU in Alexandropolis is near to be delivered in 12 months from now, and IGB, would, which uh, initially was a project that nobody thought that would be uh, finally completed in, in, in time, uh, now is already operating. So this infrastructure, that crucial infrastructure, makes Greece, Greece's role really very important for the security of supply for the south-eastern uh, part of, of Europe. Now, uh, adding the neck, the, 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 at least two FSRUs that can be very uh, soon uh, completed over the next two years, Greece's uh, import LNG capacity could uh, well exceed 2024 BCM. So that would be very, of course, important also for the U.S., as U.S. is, uh, I think, the first export nation, not the first producing country when it comes to, to gas. And probably after some uh, infrastructure is, is completed, it's going to be probably the first LNG export uh, country. Taking a leading role. I see that the clock uh, actually is on a negative uh, time, so unfortunately <laughs> we don't have uh, any more time. Uh, uh, join me please in applauding uh, all of our speakers and the Minister for the excellent discussion that we, we, we had. We can continue with uh, the next panel.